Hello, my name is Brendan Decora, and I want to welcome you to my podcast, Pro Audio Profiles. Here, I'm going to interview recording engineers, mixers, producers, and others in the pro audio field. Together, we're going to learn how you can make amazing records that can give your listeners goosebumps. Welcome to the show. Today, we have John Feeney. He's the go-to guy in Vegas for punk rock, recording bands such as Soldiers of Destruction, Damned by the Night, and The Ghostwood Murder. Enjoy the show. I want to welcome you on to the show. It's a pleasure to have you. You know, you've, I've known you for a long time, and, you know, it's it's great to, to have you on. So definitely, you know, thank you, first and foremost. Yeah, dude. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. It's been a long time, dude. <laughs> of course. <laughs> So I, I was really interested to have you on the show because you've done something that I don't know a lot of people that have. And I know a lot of people do this, but, you know, we met at a big studio in L.A., you know, we're working with all the top people, learning from the best, you know, the best uh, colleagues and equipment and everything we can do. And, you know, you, you ended up leaving town and you started your own home studio, recording bands doing your thing. And I think that's really a good perspective for a lot of people um, because not everyone has the opportunity to, you know, start in, in an amazing LA studio. So you have that unique perspective of you've seen, you know, the A-list stuff and everything else. And, you know, it's, I just want to talk to you about that because it seems really cool. Um, so one of the first things, you know, the main the main premise of this podcast is, you know, how to get great performances and and make amazing records that, you know, can help give you goosebumps or whatever. Um so it's more mm-hmm. about sharing what you know about, you know, getting artist performances rather than the gear necessarily. So um that being said, what um like how do you how do you help the artist to be inspired in your studio? Well, I think like you know, first and foremost, you know, working at a five star studio comes with a lot of pressure, not only on, you know, you as an engineer, but you know, the artist as well. Um and I think the easiest way for me to describe on how I can get performances out of artists that come in to my studio is the loss of of pressure on them. Right. So it's, it's more of a home environment. It's yeah. You know, so, you know, it's, it's really low key. Um, I always like to sit down and have a like pre-production conversation with them. If, if they're local, Mm -hmm. if they're not local, I'll do something over the phone or over, you know, video chat or something like that, but just get a game plan in place first before they even come in here. And then just, inspire them in a way of, of letting them be creative in my space. Right. Um, so I think that's, that's really just the place that I start with getting inspiring performances out of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, most of the, the folks that I work with are in my realm of, of, uh, punk rock or metal or mm-hmm. rock, you know, so I know the music really well. Um, and it became, you know, a thing where people just started coming to me because they started hearing some of the records I was doing. Right. So all that stuff just kind of snowballs. It's like, Oh, you, you know, he's great to work with. He's easy to work with. You know, he's the man is like the, the one thing I get, you know, and <laughs> you're similar in that way where you kind of stick to, <laughs> you know, one or two genres and you get really good at it and you know how to pull those performances out of people. Right. Absolutely. And what would you say? I mean, you kind of already touched on this, but some of the benefits of working, you know, in a city that is not LA that, you know, you have your home studio versus the major studio, you know? Um, I would say, you know, just freedom really, you know, uh, there's no like hustle and bustle. Um, you know, there is a time limit, but, uh, you know, for example, if you're doing, I don't, I don't remember what the rates were when we were working at the studio. I think it kind of varied depending on the caliber of the artist, but Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not charging any more than 50 to $60 an hour. So, um, that, that's one of the big benefits, right? So, you know, artists feel they can put a little bit more time in, but also you don't have that, that huge budget. So I guess it's kind of a catch 22 in that regard. Um, 
And then, you know, the ability to be experimental, I think, is huge because you don't have that huge budget or pressure over your head. You right. can be more experimental. You can do crazy things like run drums out the window with a snake uh, into the garage <laughs> to capture a different type of room sound. Like I've done that before for artists that were like, Hey, your, your drum room is not large enough for the sound I want to go for. Let's try to, you know, get a bigger drum sound. So we be experimental like that. And nice. that, that breeds better performances out of people in ways too. Cause they get really excited about that kind of stuff. You right. can just be organic with your approach, I guess you say. Right. It's almost like, you know, the big major artists that can't afford to spend months in big studios like they have the luxury of being able to do that there so it's like you open the doors for that for everyone else basically in your place so that's cool that's cool um, yeah i have an echo chamber it's it's called my garage <laughs> <laughs> awesome <laughs> that's awesome um <laughs> no so tell me about your your space like what challenges did you face when you set it up and how did you overcome them I mean, it was just uh, first and foremost, like your room, right? It was finding out how to work in the room that you, mm -hmm. you were given or that you moved into. So my house isn't very large. It's like a 1500 square foot home. Um, but that was the first thing that, you know, recording school and working in, you know, big studios had shown me is like your room is most important. So the first thing I did when I moved into my current place was start building acoustic treatment, right? And uh, mm -hmm. getting that cost down. Uh, not just buying something off Sweetwater or some expensive right. uh, acoustic uh, marketplace online. It was, you know, figuring out how to make that stuff and making it not look like you just thrown a bunch of stuff together. Um, right. And, I, you know, I've moved a couple different homes as well. So I've kind of okay. tried things out in different spaces. Right. Um, but that was one of the largest challenges, right? So it is the acoustical treatment portion of everything. Uh, I built gobos mm -hmm. myself. So that was quite a challenge because there's construction involved, you know, yeah. it's not just audio. <laughs> right. Um, and then, you know, cable management, that's always a thing because I'm kind of a little bit of a neat freak. Um, mm. so that was, that was a challenge, you know, integrating that in like patch bays and then using outboard gear because, you know, you, you're mixing all in the box. I just wanted to get some, some analog gear in here as well. So, uh, gable management, getting, you know, a snake out to my live room, which is essentially a loft at this point. Um, okay. and you know, acquiring some decent gear and, and getting, you know, a lot of your, um, gear built up pretty much. So I'd say, but the biggest thing was priding myself on being a person that strives to record real drums, acoustic treatment was first and foremost. Right. right. Well, you're, you're a drummer like yeah. me. So it's a long answer. Drums are, drums are yeah. important, you know, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, it's, and finding it's, out, you know, which, which ways you can make drywall sound great, you know? <laughs> I right. Mean, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. I, I find myself just taking like the Steve Albini approach and just putting mics on the floor. That's like kind of the best Right. Uh, room sound I can get, you know, and it nice. works really well in this space, nice. but trial and error with that too is pretty challenging sometimes. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's cool that you've, you know, obviously it's not always ideal, but it's, it's a cool thing that you were able to do this several times when you said you moved, you know? So it's like, over, I'm, I'm sure mm -hmm. with the latest iteration, you know, you've refined it every time. So. Yeah. You can definitely hear it in some of my mixes too, you know, yeah. um, <laughs> after years and years of doing it. So, right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's another thing too. Like that's actually one thing I learned a long time ago when in the days when we were working together is, you know, it's, it's more about your skills rather than the equipment you're using, you know, cause I would see guys come in and, you know, rent a ton of stuff. They said none of our equipment was good enough and their mixes sounded great, but then, someone else would come in and use nothing but the console and it's also sounded great. So, you know, it's just about learning the equipment you're using and make getting the best out of it, you know? Yeah. And I think that's really only, uh, something that a tenured engineer can tell you because younger engineers are more immature engineers. They think that you need this fancy gear to get great mixes or great you know, tracks, but, right. uh, if I could go back and do it again, I wouldn't have bought probably half the things that I bought. <laughs> <You> know, <so. laughs> 
<laughs> well, you you learn, you know. It's like when you when you have the the luxury of having all this amazing equipment to work with, you learn pretty quick that you can still make things sound pretty shitty, you know. So it's it's more than just the equipment. Yeah. You know? So <laughs> yeah. That is true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are some of the, your most memorable projects you've worked on in your home studio and what made them special? Oh man. Um, I'd probably, the first one that comes to mind is this band called the Ghostwood murder that I worked with out of Arizona. Um, and it was really cool working with them because they have a really different sound. Uh, and it was really exciting to work on and it was mm -hmm. new for the artist as well. Um, so they were just laying down some of their first tracks, but you know, they're doing like this punk project, but it's not like heavy distorted guitars. It's got a male vocalist, a female vocalist, uh, a violin player, a stand up bass player. Mm. Wow. Um, they incorporated banjo lele, which is an instrument I didn't even really know existed. So I had to record, <laughs> learn how to record a banjo lele on the fly. Wait, what the so hell I is that? I recorded a banjo before. I've never heard of that. And <laughs> so. It's a ukulele that has a drum on it, essentially. Oh, uh, like wow. a banjo. That's crazy. Okay. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, I was like, I recorded a, a banjo before and a ukulele because I, I have one, mm -hmm. uh, but never like that, you know? Yeah, that's crazy. Um, and, you know, accordion <laughs> they did and incorporated it in that track, which was awesome. Hmm. Uh, so it, it was most memorable for, for those reasons of just recording instruments you've never recorded before. Um, right. and the result was amazing when you take some of the basic principles that you've learned, right. Um, working with other instruments and just incorporated it and, and trying different things out and different miking techniques. Uh, they did like gang vocals, which is really fun, you know, to do and stuff like that. So it was a really interesting project in that regard. Um, we recorded like an acoustic violin and we did an electric violin, you know, mm -hmm. um, we tried a couple different techniques with that. Um, and you know, it was, it was just, it was, it was really fun because of that reason, you know, this, awesome. and everybody was awesome. super excited about it nice. uh, and they were really comfortable in a small space. You know what I mean? Cool. Yeah. I mean, like you were saying before, like yeah. that's, that's a really awesome benefit of, you know, a smaller place is people aren't pressured, you know, it's, they can relax and enjoy themselves, you know? So that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I really enjoyed that session. Um, there's a couple others, you know, I worked a lot with a lot of punk bands are just crazy, you know, and they come over and they're just <laughs> getting nuts and the energy is super, super high because they're screaming <laughs> about all the things that, you know, upset them or that they're right. frustrated about within right. society. Um, so there's a lot of angst that, that you get to see people relieve and you capture some really great moments. So, uh, I'd have right. to get back to you on a different time, but that was probably the most memorable. That's okay. One. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Um, so I know it can be, you know, again, like it's, you know, you don't always have the, the incredible tools available that sometimes are, are options at bigger studios, but, you know, I know, as we just talked about, you don't always need that to get, you know, awesome quality stuff. And I've heard your work. I I personally think it's great. You know, I I love what you're doing out there. So, oh, thanks, man. <laughs> of course. Um, how do you ensure that your recordings are, you know, the same quality as those produced as major studios? I mean, obviously you can't really, but your stuff sounds great. So you're doing something right. Well, I'm going to have to disagree with you that my stuff sounds great because I've heard your work uh, and yours is like what? 10 times better. And I've learned, I learned a lot from you, dude, you know, um, so you're like a mentor to me back in the day, but, um, you know, reference tracks uh, are huge, right? Um, yeah. And that's one thing that I've incorporated later in life or later in my career uh, m more than I should have earlier in my career is just using reference tracks, not only when mastering, but when mis mixing as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and then learning from a lot of the engineers that have produced these records. Um, so there's a lot of great content out there, like the URM podcast, which is the mm -hmm. ultimate recording machine podcast was really focused on like punk and metal stuff. Okay. Um, so I listened to a lot of that. 
um, produce like a pro, you know, you got some engineers that will come on and, and talk about mm-hmm. some of their projects that they had worked on in the past and, uh, just constantly educating yourself that way and reading, um, a lot as much as you can and following some of these major producers and engineers, um, mm-hmm. really helped me get better. Um, and, and most of the time it's a simple principle that you need to fix, um, in your right. workflow or in your technique rather than running out and buying a new plugin or right. something like that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, parallel compression was a huge one for me. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, when working with punk music, because I, I didn't really practice it a whole lot. Um, but I couldn't get everything to cut through and be punchy enough the way I wanted it to be. And once I found mm-hmm. that out, I was like, okay, this is like my first step into learning how to produce this kind of music because there's, hardly any dynamics in a distorted guitar, yeah. you know, and yeah. then you layer four or five of those on with some <laughs> solos at 220 BPM. It's, it gets really difficult. Right. Right. It's just <laughs> so, a wall of sound. <laughs> yeah. Just constantly educating yourself, you know, I think is probably the biggest thing. Cool. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Do you, I'm actually not sure. Do you like produce the projects you work on too, or is it just mainly engineering? Uh, my philosophy on that is, is, um, if I'm asked to produce, then, then I will. Um, right. But, uh, most of the time I like, um, just letting the artists do their thing and letting them, uh, do what they feel comfortable with. I don't want to change their sound in any way when they come in here, you know, um, I just ask that they bring everything that they use to get their sound. But sometimes, you kind of have to step in and, and say, Hey, why don't we do this instead in a nice way, obviously, mm-hmm. because you know, some, some, some people can roll in with some equipment that's less than stellar. Um, yeah. and it's, it's not great. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I've done some producing and, and stuff like that in the past, um, and made suggestions when asked to do so, you know? Right. Right. So do you, um, do you help? Like, obviously you're not, trying to change things drastically, but do you help artists kind of, you know, sculpt their sound a little bit, find their vision for the project? Is that anything that you do normally or? Yeah, you know, I, I do. Um, and it's some projects I'll take on um, because I simply just love the band or the artist. Right. Mm-hmm. And I just really want to get them in that, my studio and I really want to produce that sound and I'll approach them and say, Hey, look, you know, I think you have something really special here. Um, and, uh, um, I'll, I'll produce it with them. You know, I just recorded, uh, an all girl punk band from, um, Arizona as well. And, mm-hmm. um, they, they kind of wanted me to, to produce them a little bit. Right. So, uh, I'll just, you know, do it and make suggestions. Like, I feel like this guitar part, you know, should be more grungier. Um, we need right. to use like a different amp on the, on this right, right here. Like this part mm. should sound like more like L seven versus, you know, some soft, clean guitar instead. And I'll make suggestions like that and, and set it up to, to do it. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, when, when producing it, it, it becomes, uh, difficult to tread lightly without stepping on their sound, right? You don't want to take away too much uh, from the band's vision. Uh, And that's why you ask them first and foremost, like, what are you going for? You know, what are your, some of your favorite bands? Can you send me a reference of what you'd like to sound like? Right. Um, And I've had it, I've had it work uh, against me too. uh, If I'm being a hundred percent honest, like I've recorded a band um, and they wanted to do everything live off the floor in the same room. And at my place, it doesn't work well. Right. Yeah. There's no separation unless I put amps in separate rooms, but they wanted everything in the same room. Oh, wow. Right. Okay. I was like, this is going to be really hard to do. And they didn't, they didn't end up liking it at the end because I, I ended up doing everything track by track. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, when making suggestions like to produce bands like that, it's, it's, it can be some kind of sometimes difficult to, uh, understand what they want. I, and then at the end I was like, well, I guess you guys don't really want me to produce you then because this is the sound that I would, I would put out. Right. right. So, um, <laughs> but I would say like 50% of the projects I do, like, uh, I run a small label, right. So it's, uh-huh. it's very small. I have another partner. Um, and we signed a few bands. Um, and one of the bands that we had signed on there, uh, I produced their whole record because I okay. just really loved their sound. It's like this Hispanic hardcore punk. Mm-hmm. Um, and me and the bass player produced the record together. 
you know, okay. we, we did all the work together. We made all the suggestions of the sounds, the amps, the guitars, the drums, you know, mm-hmm. that we would, we would put on it and stuff like that. And I even made suggestions uh, in songwriting um, that they should change, um, that they still play live today, you know? So it's right. kind of cool to see right. some of those ideas that you had in the studio uh, kind of change the, the sound that they go out with live. So right. um, yeah, I'd, I'd say like 50% of the stuff. Um, okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Um, so tell me more about your, your label. I know you've been a part of that for a while. Um, like how often how often do you put out stuff on the label? Uh, it just depends. Um, me, most of the bands are local to Vegas, right? Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, so we, I started this label back in like 2013 with my friend Dave. And we just did it for fun. You know, when I was getting my home studio off the ground, I was like, I need a couple bands to get a name for myself and I'll just mm-hmm. record them for free. And, right. um, you know, we, we started and we just started putting out albums, um, from there. So we did, you know, band after band after band after band till about 2015. And then I kind of took like a hiatus and then, um, I joined my most recent band, which is soldiers of destruction, right. uh, which is an old UK punk band from 1982. You've seen us. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> <That's> crazy. <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> the lead singer, uh, Morat, um, called me one day. He goes, Hey, would you really want to do this for real? Like, let's get, let's LLC this thing. Let's get some really good bands going. And he's got really great connections within the, the music industry. Nice. Um, and I said, yeah, absolutely. I've been waiting for someone to do it with me. So, um, we signed ourselves and then we signed right. our first band, Lean 13, um, okay. out of Vegas, which is that Hispanic punk band that I was talking to you about. Mm-hmm. Um, and we put out, um, an LP from a band in, london called defcon zero okay um did you did you record that too or was that something else no i did not record that so we just really really thought the album was stellar and decided to put it out awesome um and we have a website where we we sell everything at it's called iamdeadly.com so it's a it's an artist collective web page um but we have a section on there that we sell merch and and music Mm -hmm. through um and then more recently, I've been working with uh, this band called the Boulevard Bullies. Um, they're mm-hmm. kind of like an oi street pop punk kind of sound. Um, and I have a side project that we're releasing, doing like a seven inch. Uh, it's called Damn by the Night, which is like a horror punk band. Um, okay. So we're, we're getting rolling and we got a couple other projects that we're, we're coming up with too. So right. it's still kind of in its infancy. We didn't really get it going until like 2021, but uh mm-hmm we're very selective in, in who we put on the label because we, we want it to have a specific sound, if that makes sense. Right. I just want to take a quick break and tell you about my free guide detailing my techniques for recording huge snare sounds. Check it out now at brandondecora.com slash huge snare. And now back to the show. Uh, tell me more about your, your band. I know like they started in the eighties, but Obviously, you didn't join until later. Did did they have any records back then, or is it the <laughs> record you did the first one? It's actually funny that you asked, because, yeah, I wasn't even born when uh, <laughs> they started that band. Right. <laughs> they, were, they started in 82. Okay. Um, so, back in the UK 82, I don't know if you know much about, about uh, UK 82 punk rock, but Mm-hmm. There was bands like GBH and the Exploited, um, Peter and the Test Two Babies, um, and that whole punk move it that just kind of exploded after the Sex Pistols had that one record and then fell okay. off. Uh, but it just kept going, um, and they had that sound that labels were looking for at that time, and uh, they got offers from all over the place and decided not to sign because they're punk fucking rock right <laughs> they don't they don't want to sell out and sign a sign to a, a major label um right. and then I, I i know two of the members had passed away uh oh, wow. and you know uh, the the band just kind of called it quits until our singer had moved to vegas and they started it back up in 2019 um hmm. i was in another band and uh we ended up sharing a bill with soldiers of destruction and um the guitar player said, Hey, we might be looking for a drummer. Cause I, we think our drummer's going to quit. Like, would you be interested? And okay. I was like, maybe, you know, we'll talk about it. And they said, in the meantime, 
like, we want to do five songs. So, uh, put us down. And I was like, I'd love to do the project, you know, okay. because those songs have never been recorded since. Wow. Like there's boom box recordings from the eighties, but that's right. it. Right? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> um, from the back of the, from the back of the 100 club in London. Right. Uh, so we did the five songs and then, um, their drummer ended up quitting. Okay. Uh, so, Oh, so it's not even you on the record. It is. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, it's me. Okay. <laughs> so, so the record is, I think, 14, 12 or 14 songs. I forget. Okay. Um, there's there's like three songs on the record that are not played by me. I see. Okay. Uh, but other than that, I played everything else. Yeah. Cool. Um, so 2020 hit. We play, I played one show with them, and then the pandemic right. happened, right? right? And then we just took that entire <laughs> pandemic to work on it. And then uh, I think we released it in June 2021. Nice. Nice. Yeah, and we're cool. working on the next one right now. So I was actually doing some mixing last night for it. It's turning oh, out sweet. awesome. Sweet. Is there a expected release date or is any of that figured out? Not yet, because you know we want to get like to a full LP length. So we only have about seven okay. songs uh, right now. But yeah, it'll probably be end of twenty twenty three. Okay, so you're writing and recording at the same time. Yeah, so we wrote like seven songs because we have a feature that uh, is, um supposed to happen and we're really okay. excited about this person featuring on our album nice. so we had to get it done um before that person goes on tour and oh, okay. uh, gotcha. we'll find out who it is later hopefully that's cool <laughs> <laughs> cool <laughs> yeah awesome man um so there's just a couple you know re- uh, standard questions i ask every guest um at the very end uh so the first one is what is your most influential teacher? Um, and I know it's hard to like say just in the just audio realm one. or just in general in the audio realm. Yeah. Face to face, man. I'd, I'd ha- it would have to be you, man, to be honest. What? Like you, you helped me through a ton. <laughs> Seriously. Man. You don't even know how much you did for me, man. You helped me learn all those rooms. Um, and we're like a mentor to me for sure. Um, awesome. I appreciate that. I'd have that. to say, yeah, you're, you're definitely in that in that department. Um, there is, uh, man, I can't think of who else. Um, I had a one teacher at the conservatory that was Mm -hmm. uh, amazing. His name was Dirk. Um, do you remember him? I don't don't know if he was there when you were there. He was there when I was there. Yeah. That guy would stay with me, uh, every single day after class and before class and teach me the G series SSL. Nice. Um, and just like was Mr. Miyagi, uh, right. when learning that, that console. <laughs> nice. Um, and then, you know, James Murray, uh, over at Glenwood, uh, yeah. back in the day, rest That's in right. peace. Yeah. Uh, towards, towards the end of my career there, he, he taught me a ton, man. Cause I was assisting him on a lot of stuff. Right. Um, and he, he wasn't that type of guy that would really take the time out to, to show you something. Right. Um, but there were key moments there, man, where he would, you know, break down metal drums for me. We worked on uh, Guitar Hero 3. Oh, yeah. I think I did some of those sessions with him, too. Yeah. Yeah. So he was just really teaching me on how to get like a modern rock and metal sound. Um, nice. On that, uh, was it the Neve 8068 that they had yeah. there in that B room? Yep. Um, it's crazy. So. Yeah, I mean, he, he was he was he was pretty influential in in shaping the way I view things. So, nice. yeah, I'd have to say you, Dirk at Crass. I don't even know if he's still there. And okay. then uh, James. Yeah, awesome. Um, the next question is, what is your favorite reference track? You know, if, obviously it changes for hmm. if you're mixing or whatever. But if there's one that's your go-to, what would it be? Man, I'd have to say. Enter Sandman. <laughs> nice. <laughs> cool. Yeah, what about you? I'm just curious. <laughs> Did you already answer this question? Um, yeah, there's a Australian band named Carnival, and they have a song called New Day. And it's it's like prog rock, but it's, you know, it goes through the ups and downs. Like, there's really quiet, mellow verses, and then super heavy parts. And so it just kind of rounds out everything, you know. I'm just really familiar with gotcha. how it sounds on different speakers and stuff. So, yeah, I, I would have to say like 
the runner up would have to be like drain you from Nirvana. Okay. It's a good one. Okay. Nice. <laughs> All right. Last question, which we've already kind of touched on a little bit, but what would be one tidbit you have for an upcoming engineer? Just record for free to get <laughs> your feet wet. Right. And just learn the key principles of the science behind sound and mm -hmm. signal flow. Um, right. And do as many sessions as you can, not only to understand what you're doing in the audio realm, but to learn how to work with people. Right. Because this is not a, this is not an audio business. It's a people business. Yes. Yeah. That would be my piece of advice to a new, to new engineers. Cause you can be the nerdiest guy right. in the world and know everything there is to know about audio. But if you can't work with people, yeah, that is the unfortunate right. uh, end of your career at that point. <laughs> you know, Right. <laughs> for sure. Well, awesome, man. I really appreciate it. Th thank you so much for being on the podcast and, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, be in touch for sure. Thanks, man. Right on, man, dude. Thanks for having me on, dude. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to the show. As you know, I'm just getting this started, and I'd love your feedback on how I'm doing, if I should keep this going, what your thoughts are. Feel free to visit ProAudioProfiles.com and send me a message. Until next time.